Greetings, everybody. Welcome to our Think Green Thursdays for uh, August 13th. Today's class is lasagna gardening, featuring our, our uh, instructors, Kurt and Gail Moore, who are uh, well-versed on this topic because they've been doing it. So can't wait to, <laughs> to hear all about it. And uh, Kurt and Gail, let us in on it. Okay. Uh, well, greetings, everybody. Uh, it's the first time I'm doing one of these by myself um, remotely rather than doing something in person. Uh, if you want to unmute yourselves and have short questions, uh, happy to take uh, questions and either Gail or I answer them depending on what they are. Um, and we should have some time afterwards uh, to discuss things. So hopefully everybody's seeing the shared screen, lasagna gardening, and we'll get started. So what we're going to look at is, you know, what is a lasagna garden? Uh, how to construct one? Uh, what to plant? A lot of this is experiential, so it's what we did. Sort of like if you remember back in grade school, you came back in September and say what had to do an essay of what you did last summer. Uh, we'll look at then maintaining the garden and other problems that you might want to consider. So basically, here's the concept. So it has, uh, like a big uh, sheet of lasagna, it's constructed by various layers. And it comes out of organic uh, gardening uh, tradition. And um, th these types of layers aren't fixed. There's a strategy to it. Uh, but you can use different materials and the idea is that this should be sort of uh, cheap and use as many materials as you have in and around a yard. So lasagna gardens are also known as uh, sheet composting. You might see that term in the literature. It's meant to be uh, cheap, like I said, using existing materials, a, a sort of a no dig, no till gardening method. Um, and it, like you already said, it refers to how the garden is built, just different layers. Uh, successive layers of organic materials and what you often want to do is alternate between uh, green and brown layers with the idea of having your brown layers uh, being uh, a little bit thicker than your green layers by a factor of uh, two or three and like anything uh, that's uh, was essentially it's compost uh, pile and so it'll cook down over time uh, it'll break down it'll decompose it'll also lose some height so part of the maintenance that we'll talk about later on is to keep you that build up if you do. Of course, uh, earthworms help a lot with the process and you can maintain it by adding more materials, plants and other things over time. So this is a book we got, uh, Gail found it and decided, oh, let's do this. Uh, the book was published in 1998 and it's sort of like one of those books that sort of started the whole movement. Uh, it's all based on organic gardening. Uh, but for our purposes, uh, things, the two most important chapters are chapter one, lasagna garden basics, which uh, tells you how to uh, construct the garden. And then down to number seven, which is called uh, ignoring problems. And we'll talk about that later. The intervening chapters two through six are just really basic gardening, except that you're just doing it in a different environment rather than in the ground or in a raised bed. And then um, chapter eight, uh, finishing touches, addresses, um, you know, other things that you might want to do to the garden, you know, spiff it up, put a fence around it or yard art or whatever else you want to do. And we'll talk a little bit about that at the end. So uh, obviously some planning, it is an easy way to start a garden. And so part of the planning process is, uh, you know, where do you want to put it? And that's going to depend on what sort of things you're going to grow in it. Uh, you know, is it, uh, you want shade, you want sun, you want partial uh, shade. Uh, you know, so if obviously you're doing hostas, you want shade garden, you're doing cactus, you want sun. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The next thing you want to decide is you want a flower garden, a vegetable garden, or some other type. Uh, our choice, we want a flower garden. Uh, know that this is going to take a lot of time because part of the process is uh, it has to decompose. Uh, water is one of your friends so that will help the process rather than let it dry out. Uh, water is important to the decomposition of the process and, of course, uh, earthworms. 
right now is probably the best time to start one if you want one for next year. So, you know, this afternoon, go out and get your materials. Yeah, we started ours in July. Yes. So you want to pick your materials next. Uh, like I said, use what you can gather from your own yard and buy additional ingredients if needed. Uh, <coughs> we were able to use most of the stuff from uh, our own yard. Uh, your first layer that you want to put down is probably like cardboard or a thick layer of newspapers, and that's for weed control. Then your bigger rough stuff, like small branches, bush trimmings, if you've trimmed the hedge, uh, any of those sort of things, you put then over the top of your cardboard. Uh, then there's about any other type of waste you can consider as you're building these levels, and that might be uh, you know other yard waste. Uh, uh, rather than take all your uh, leaves out to the curb to have the city pick them up, you might want to put them in your garden. Uh, grass clippings, of course. Um, uh, either commercial compost or your own compost, depending on how much you need. Uh, we went with commercial uh, since we needed a lot. <coughs> Some sort of straw layer, another brown layer. And then there's any other types of things you can throw in it. You know, if you want sphagnum moss, put it in there, bag manure, kitchen scraps, etc. And just uh, keep repeating these layers until you get sort of the height and the area that you want. So pick a spot. What we decided to do is we had two little garden uh, areas, sort of rings around two willow oak trees, and decided to fill in the space in between and turn it into one big garden. So right here, you can see we've got our first layer down. We had a lot of cardboard boxes and stuff that I'd put away for using. So it was easy, helped clear out the carport. Um, one of the few good uses for the Burlington newspaper is, um, then we use that to sort of round out some other areas uh, because we don't have uh, parrots. You can see down here in the lower left, you know, a bit of a log branch. And then we had been uh, trimming some of our bushes and doing other things in yard cleanup. So all that went on there. Plus our neighbor's trash cans. Pardon? I said, plus some of our neighbor's trash cans. We yeah. remember we raided Pat's. Yes. Trash cans out front. For um, uh, her yard waste. Yeah. So if you don't have enough yard waste, just ask your neighbors. So there's a view. So the trees are on either side, right and left. You can see a little bit of the garden uh, on this side and a little bit over here. So that was, that was July 1 is when we started. And that was a low spot in the yard also is why yes. we chose to do this is to help fill it in. So um, just more lawn and yard waste, as you can see. We had a wheelbarrow full of old soil and other stuff, so that got thrown in there as well. And our own yard waste. And then just keep adding until you uh, get what you want. And you also, as you're building it up, successively smaller pieces. So you don't want to put your logs on top. You, know, you put your bigger stuff on the bottom. Uh, so then a point comes, you stomp it down and spread it evil, easily or evenly and uh, go on to the next layer. So this is basically a, mostly a green layer at this point. So our third layer, we we're going to do a brown layer and that was straw bales. Uh, a, having done this the first time, we really didn't know how many we needed. We didn't buy this many, but we still bought too much. So we ended up only using about four out of the 15. So over in this part of the driveway, we've got a the rest of them all tarp for some other project. So we start on this fairly rapidly. So we're only five days into the process here and we've got our straw layer down. So, you know, we've uh, completed basically three layers, the, the cardboard, the rough yard waste, and uh, now some straw. And so you can see the two trees, the garden areas that it's uh, adjoining. Yeah. Then additional materials for soil enrichment. And so we've got a, you know, collection of uh, manure bags and moss over here. And as you can see, we've been starting on the uh, next level. 
So layer four uh, was uh, going to be uh, compost. And uh, since that was fairly sizable, uh, we decided, you know, we'll get it by the pickup load. And that's a lot cheaper too. You'll spend about half and you, then you don't have to drag all the bags uh, with you. And, and if you don't have a pickup truck, find a friend that has one. Uh, people with pickup trucks always have friends. Or, uh, you know, you can have it delivered. If you're going to need something like about five cubic yards or so, uh, you might want to consider doing that. And so since this was a gradual process, we just did, you know, pickup tr truck load at a time. So here's this fourth lever finished. So we're two weeks into the project at this point. After we got this all done, uh, as you can see from the shade, it's getting towards the end of the day. So we just parked ourselves over on a patio off to the left here, uh, had a glass of wine or two and watched the birds do their things. They just really love this going in there, uh, pecking away and trying to find stuff. Uh, we decided we were going to add a water feature uh, eventually to this. This is not done. You'll see it later on our to-do list. Uh, but because we wanted to have some aquatic plants. And so we were trying to figure out what to get. And we found this thing, which is actually the kid's sandbox. And we got these at a really dynamite, great low price at uh, BJ's. And this is a lid for it to cover it. So um, we'll probably finish this part of it next year. A lid will come off and we'll fill it with water. Um, speaking of, you know, additional materials, uh, so all these little white flecks right here, is just shredded office paper. So uh, all I have to do is pull the canister out of my shredder, take it out back, uh, dump it, it'll go to good use. And so here we are in October and fall, so I started pulling up uh, leaves that had come down. And this is our uh, Blair, little uh, Scotty helper. She loves to climb on stuff. Yeah, the higher, the better. So now we've jumped into spring about six months later to see how things have decomposed. So you can see the, how the leaves have already changed and additional leaves from our willow oaks. Um, those things are real pain in the butt, but found a good use for their leaves. And so we're, you know, looking over here in the detail to see how some of these things, uh, you know, what's the state of decomposition about at this point we're about eight, nine months into the process. So, uh, so it's spring, sort of, and uh, we're back at it and we decided to do additional strong compost layers and try to build up some of the things that's gonna be around these two water features over here. Hmm. So uh, if you don't have a gym membership, this is great because you're moving everything by hand. Uh, pick up load a cubic yard of compost weighs approximately 1,100 pounds. Um, Overstrained the truck one time because I had a miscommunication and they put two cubic yards into the truck. So I'm glad I got home without burning out the transmission. And in the back, you can see our greenhouse and our regular garden area. So with the raw lasagna garden, uh, you don't have to wait to plant into your new garden. So if you started one now, you got all, you know, your basic layers and everything in, uh, you don't have to wait for it to uh, decompose to start planting things in. You can do that now. And at this point, uh, one of the reasons called like no dig is you can basically just pull the layers apart by your hand, um, put whatever plants you want in there, push it back together, add any other soil enrichment. Um, you know, that's your choice. Um, we cooked ours uh, mostly. We did put a few plants in last year, but um, for the most part, uh, they were just around the edges where they joined the other uh, small uh, garden rings. Uh, we did adjust the height because uh, it did fall, uh, you know, decompress a bit, and we started planting this year. So then your next choice is once you've got basic garden going, you know, what are you going to plant in it? Flower or vegetable garden? And if you go with the flower, you know, question is you want annuals, perennials, some sort of mix, um, you know, 
you're lazy like us, uh, prefer uh, perennials and you don't have to replant every spring. And of course, the other choices are sun, shade, or something in between. Like I said, whether you were planning on doing sunflowers or hostas is gonna choose. So we chose the flower garden route, <coughs> excuse me, um, as uh, we were joining two existing uh, small flower gardens. We already had a vegetable garden. Uh, if you're going out buying plants, you know, obviously you wanna buy good quality, healthy plants. Uh, whether it's flowers or vegetables. Um, use your plants to attract beneficial insects. Uh, that's gonna keep your garden healthy uh, as well. Uh, if you're doing something uh, where you want native plants or flowers or shrubs, uh, obviously letting you know these are more disease resistant because they're native to the area. And then any type of transplants, you know, you go to the big box store like Lowe's, you know, buy those overpriced uh, plants from uh, Bonnie, or you can split some of your own and move it from other parts of the garden, get things from a neighbor or a friend, and we've done sort of a mix of all of these. So again, in the case for native plants, uh, for those of you that are interested in native plants, uh, you know, obviously, like I said, they're, they're native, so they're adapted to local conditions. Uh, they also tend to support more types of insects, uh, particularly the ones that are native to the area because uh, they grew, you know, evolved together in a symbiotic relationship with each other. And natives are endowed with more natural protections. Uh, so uh, again, low maintenance. So you're not out there all the time either having to, um, you know, spray plants uh, or replace them. Um, Basically, you know, the, that symbiotic relationship, they're encrypted to produce fruit and nectar to attract wildlife to your gardens. Now, you are going to get, you may get some unwanted wildlife, so we'll talk about that a little bit later in pest control. But, uh, you know, if you put them in the right place, the right environment uh, that sort of mimics their natural environment, uh, they're going to live long and they're going to be um, at low maintenance. And uh, depending on if they're plants that are dividable, they'll be easy to divide. So this was our plant list. I'm gonna turn this over to Gail at this point and she can talk about what she chose and why. Well, some of these were just what we got on one of our field trips. Um, I think it was to Niche Gardens, the one that was going out of business. And um, it, this is just stuff that I tried to go more native and stick with perennials. So all of our gardens have been a transition to uh, as many native things as I can get. Um, I have to say the bog, sal um, the bog sage, the cherry chief, and the uh, joe pie weed, and the mountain mint especially have been big pollinator magnets this year for me that we've really, really noticed. Um, my rustin sage isn't large enough yet, but that one was a big one when we had it out front. And so it's just been so much fun to watch um, bees and wasps and um, the pollinators come through to um, you can notice them going from plant to plant. The mountain mint has been incredible. There's a picture coming up somewhere. I've got some circles around it, which I hope people can see where um, it was hard to get a picture of what was on the mint there was a variety of um, flies and wasps. It's just really cool and being able to stand there and not get stung. <laughs> so um, sure, that's next. really it. It's more like, and this is, was another thing too. Some of these plants I got from when we had our um, plant exchange from the master gardeners or even things that we, were, we sold in our last plant sale. Oh, you can change, Kurt. Okay. Yeah. This is our Texas star. This is one that we got. I got from um, one of our field trips along with the uh, Joe Pye weed. This is a white one. I normally have um, that purplish, and I just thought this was unusual, but they've both been doing real well. Um, I don't see. This one just started to bloom this year. Um, I gave one to, I think it was Janelle and the deer keep eating hers. So we may have to split one up again. So 
go ahead, Kurt. There. And then this, oh, this is really cool. The um, cut leaf cone flower has, this is a, one of the perennials that I've stumbled on that has been really good in our garden. And the, um, the bees and hummingbirds have been going to it. But this expands and it doesn't, and it doesn't, um, it'll die back somewhat and then come back full force in the spring, but it's a perennial. So it's nice to have that you don't have to replant some of these. The cone flowers have been a really exceptional value this year in our other gardens. The goldfinches have been coming in and raiding all the seeds. I think I've got seven or eight colors in the back garden by in front of the greenhouse. So I think I'm going to put some more cone flowers in this garden so that it expands across the yard but I've had more goldfinches this year than I than ever. The Russian sage is small right now but this is another pollinator magnet that's been um, an exceptional plant in our gardens and it's one that we had out front but we lost it last year for some reason and when it's big and bushy like out in front of um, the city park in the medians Everyone seems to stop and look at it coming around our cul-de-sac. A lot of people will stop and drive by the garden and look, and that's one that everyone asks on, asks about. So go ahead. Um, the one on the right is the bog sage. That was one that I picked up from one of our field trips, and it's grown exceptionally well and is another bee magnet and the um, hummingbird magnet. And then we've got some Miss Huff. And I actually found out I have two or three of them. So I'll have to watch. I may have to move them because I know they get big. And the little plant in the front or at the bottom of the screen there with the lantana is actually a butterfly bush that I've carted around for the last 20 years. We started it in Tallahassee. It's a variegated leaf, lavender colored um, butterfly bush that I was able to successfully start cuttings from. So I have one in a pot and I have one here. Eventually I'll get another one out front. But, um, but it's just been fun to put something here and something there and then watch to see what does well and what doesn't and move it around. And then the Salvia is one that I got a piece of out of our Arbor Gate garden. And um, Jeff dug a cutting up for me. And that was probably the first thing I stuck into the lasagna garden last year because I needed a spot for it and I knew I wanted to put it in there. So it's bushed out and it's probably three times the size of what it was when we first stuck it in the ground. And the bees and hummingbirds are on this thing every morning. Well, the bees and the wasps and the flies are on it all day long, but the hummers can't check it out. Seems like more morning and afternoon. And then this is the mountain mint that's gone crazy. So, um, and it smells good. It's just a wonderful plant to put in here. It's been successful. And I'm not sure. And then, yeah, here's our beneficial critters your turn okay so this sort of <clears throat> um, box that Gail and I put together is sort of things you want to attract uh, to uh, your garden actually any type of garden so obviously uh, earthworms um, you know any types of pollinators bees wasps flies you name it uh, ants birds etc uh, you also want um, the next two Braconid wasps and tachinid flies are parasitical um, insects. And uh, so braconid wasps are famous for uh, laying their larvae on things like uh, the hornworm uh, uh, caterpillars. And tachinid flies uh, also do a similar thing on other caterpillars. And then the last two, ladybugs and ground beetles are often predators and they'll go after other uh, nuisance uh, insects like aphids and such. Um, 
over here a couple of resource sites uh, that have been put together, uh, two of them through uh, uh, North Carolina Ag Extension on pollinator gardens, uh, native plants, and um, top 25 plants. These are sources that uh, Gail had found, so I don't know if you want to say anything more about them or not. I think these are ones that we've all run across at one point or another. The pollinator pathway, I believe, was something that I found with Debbie Ruse out in Pittsburgh. But um, there's multi-links from this particular page. And there's so much out there when you go looking, one link leads to another. And then you spend hours on the computer. <laughs> So here's a couple of pictures that Gail took, and uh, I know it might be sort of hard to see. So over here, uh, we've got a solitary bee on, was that the salvia, Gail? That's the cherry chief salvia. Okay. And then these are sort of hard to see, but this is probably the best example of just one of the wasps on uh, one of the uh, plants. Yeah, I tried my hand at putting, trying to show where these were. This is the mountain mint. and they're usually covered and they don't, you know, just sit there and pose for a picture. So I tried to go back and enlarge this so that it was a little easier to see. But these two plants themselves, it's just fun to stand out there and look at the activity across all the flowers or the blooms, I should say, I guess. So, you know, just basic things of maintenance like you would do with any other garden. Um, like I said, you know, if you want the decomposition to happen faster and uh, uniformly uh, keeping it wet, not too wet so that things don't rot as opposed to decompose. Uh, you're still going to do some weeding. Uh, what I've noticed living here is uh, it's a constant battle with weeds. Even though you've got a weed layer below that, there's a lot of stuff that's windblown. Uh, obviously, uh, pest control like you would do with any other garden, maintain your plants, and uh, you can just keep adding materials to it because like I said, as it decomposes, it'll go down a bit in height. And if you have a particular plan or scheme where you want different materials or different heights, you know, a little bit of uh, topography to it, uh, you'll need to stay on top of that. So this is... Uh, based sort of on chapter seven in the book, Ignoring Problems. You know, it's like any type of garden, you can choose what to ignore. <coughs> uh, obviously don't ignore deer or groundhogs. Uh, we're generally more plagued with groundhogs in our uh, vegetable garden out back, but as you know, groundhog or deer coming in, a deer would, over the evening and a groundhog over the course of the day can do a considerable amount of damage. Uh, Obviously, you don't want to ignore slugs and insect pests. Uh, so part of the reason is, you know, do you want to do, you know, organic pest control or non-organic? That's your choice. Uh, bringing in different beneficial predator insects or parasitical insects, insects is obviously uh, uh, another way to do pest control. And then uh, depending on how you think of them, uh, you know, it's your choice what you want to plant in there. So some weeds you might want to leave in, depending on what part of the country you're from. Like I'm from the Midwest, we consider morning glories to be uh, real pests, especially in the uh, cornfields. But you know, um, you know, the weed or flower is in the eye of the beholder. So these are some that we have uh, in various parts of our yard and our uh, gardens. So here's what it looked like a few days ago. So we're coming to the end here and, um, you know, we'll be adding more to it. As you can see, the uh, last straw and uh, compost layers are starting to decompose. We'll be adding more to it this year as we go forward. And here's a couple of details that Gail might want to comment about. Oh, they're just from each end of the yard. Um just to show how the um, cherry chief, which is the photo on the left, has just filled out. 
and we've got some tall items. I think the, the tallest one that's kind of in the center of that picture is a um, lollipop verbena, which has gone past its flower, but um, it's still, it still is um, attractive to smaller flies and bees. And then our, I don't know, you, Kurt, you'll have to point it out, but our night blooming oh. Orchid cactus has a couple flowers that are going to bloom hopefully in the next few weeks. Yeah, it's in the upper right of the right picture here. There's hanging one in the left the picture too. It's just hanging. Oh, yeah, we're here. But um, that'll bring in the night moths that you'll for um, pollination. I think we've seen a couple sphinx moths, not too often, but they're there. But um, it's just been a variety. It's just trial and error with what you want. It's starting to take shape and um, take some height and filling in. In the right-hand picture, the what I started doing with some of the families of birds, especially the smaller wrens, is um, putting bird seed or mealworm down on the ground underneath some of the plants in there to let them have at it before the bigger birds came in. And every now and then the birds help us out and we get the odd sunflower or two growing in some place. Oh yeah. And the wild asters. And the other thing I haven't really talked about is, you know, we're, most of this is on the ground with our trees here and we have a trellis behind this uh, one with a climbing plant. Uh, you know, you can have verticality to your lasagna garden as well, uh, depending on what sort of, you know, structures or things that you might want to put in there. So that sort of gets us uh, towards the end here. And our this is our to-do list, things that still need to be done, uh, additional plants. We're gonna put a couple pavers to go through there so we're not having to stomp on the plants to get in to do maintenance, particularly when we get the water feature completed next year. Um, you know, maybe a concrete stone border uh, to keep grass from encroaching on it. Um, more vertical climbing plants. And of course, we already have the pots on the trees as well. And you know, you can do anything. So this is really what chapter eight in the book talks about uh, additional things that you want to do, you know, whether it's fencing, yard art, um, you know, things like that in it. Uh, it. And it's, you know, like any garden, it's your choice. So at this point, we'll take any questions people have. Uh, I have a question. Did you yeah. check the Did you check the pH, or do you check the pH of that garden? Or and what amendments did you put in besides all the things that you already mentioned? Um, we haven't done any pH checking yet because it's still sort of work in progress. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something uh, we'll want to do, and no additional amendments other than what I've shown you as we. Um, go forward, we'll probably continue using some of the same materials. Uh, you know, I do have to rebuild a uh, three bin compost uh, pit out back. So obviously some of that <coughs> stuff will be going in and maybe some soil enrichments, you know, just around the roots of the plants when we uh, uh, get new plants and put them in the ground. Mm. I'm just curious, that really big branch you showed in the bottom layer, yeah. did that actually decompose over a year? Um, can't really tell because it's covered by the other layers, but I'm, so I'm not sure that it will have decomposed all the way. I, I know, know it must have gotten anything. soft because that's about the area where I planted the, um, the um, cherry chief. Mm -hmm. the, <laughs> and some of the other plants that were toward that edge. And I might not have gone down as far to hit that log or whatever. And it wasn't a big limb. I shouldn't say log. It wasn't a real big, big limb. I think it just was a little deceiving. It's, it's probably what, about four inches around. So it was big enough. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm sure that it'll, little by little. Did you add any mineral soil? add any what? Mineral soil, clay? No. Just compost and? 
I put some ash down out of our yeah. fireplace one time. I had a bucket that I spread out. Mm -hmm. um, and that's probably about the only thing that that yeah. I didn't purchase. That was it. And that was a while back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you and put other things in there. Um, pardon? I'm sorry. Did you fertilize any of the plants as you planted them or just, um, or two weeks later or anything? Or did you just figure you had a rich enough environment from all that decomposing? I know I haven't put any additional fertilizer. I don't know if Gail has, as she's been doing most of the planting. Any time, I usually use one of the um, capsuled mm -hmm. um, fertilizer, slow release whenever I plant something. Mm -hmm. to go in with it. And a lot of times what I'll do if I'm making a big mix of um, planting soil, I'll mm -hmm. add it into that. But as far as adding like a 10, 10, 10 or anything like that over the, the cover of um, that particular area, we, I didn't, I haven't done anything like that. Just mainly when there's an individual plant going in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right now we figure with the mix of materials we have, it's probably a rich enough environment. But obviously, as part of going forward, you know, with annual maintenance, uh, putting additional materials in. Well, Cecilia says, I've done lasagna gardening on top of hugel culture. Yeah. And it, breaks with down that. Pretty, and it breaks down pretty fast. I probably said that wrong, but that's okay. I was just going to say, I just saw, saw that too. And that's up yeah. Kurt's alley. It was one of the things that we were talking about. Okay. So I'm going to let him explain it. Yeah. He had a slide in that he took out because it would have just have been tangential on a uh, Google culture, but um, there's a lot known and unknown about it as to whether it's a recent thing or whether it really is based upon Germanic gardening techniques that date back to the middle ages. But again, it's, it's also a type of layering, but the bottom layers are really rough layers. You'd be using big chunks of wood. Hmm. And if the person who asked that question, I can't see who it was, wanted to unmute themselves, they could explain a little bit more what they did. She said, it's, for me, it's necessary due to big logs on the property, so. Yeah. And another, one I was going to uh, just mention too, the um, chinampas, which is an American Aztec type of gardening in wet environments where they actually build layered levels in uh, low water areas of parts of Lake uh, Texcoco. They look like floating islands. Yeah, so it's almost like uh, a, a cross between uh, uh, lasagna gardening and uh, land reclamation. Hmm. It's a different approach. I do use swales because I live in a swamp, mm -hmm. um, and but but a dry swamp because it hasn't really rained here for two years. It rains oh. very little um, in in our particular neighborhood. So mm -hmm. I had to create Google cultures to sort of create the swales to, to try to keep with some of the not having to water all the time, and when it rains, it tends to fill up. So for me, the swale is the idea of trying to keep it away from the chicken coop and directing the water to where I want it rather than where it would normally go. Mm. Well, maybe you could give a future presentation on that for us. <laughs> Still learning every day. <laughs> That's a good day. Gardening is always a good day. <laughs> Definitely. And therapy, good therapy. Exactly. Like I say, good therapy and you get tomatoes. Yeah. So like it says, cheap, no dig, no till method. The book oh, is God. widely available used. Um, Gail found it in a used bookstore, but if you go online, you can find uh, copies. It's in hardback uh, for about five bucks. This recording will go okay. on YouTube. And I can put the links in the, in the uh, description, I suppose. Yeah. Thank you. So, Kurt, are you going to try vegetables? Oh, in, in this? Well, this is going to be all oh, plant. Oh, uh, cool. I have one box that I need to repair in our vegetable garden, actually rebuild, and I could always try doing that out there. 
So if you have an existing, like a um, already a vegetable garden, could you just go ahead and like say, for instance, now start your fall vegetables using this method or would you do the layers first and then do it next year or in the spring? You can plant in it right away. Uh, it depends on what you want to plant in it. Um, like, you could, like the you, fall vegetables like lettuce, broccoli. Yeah, because those don't go real deep. So you want to make sure that you've got a good compost uh, type or soil layer, you know, at the top. Um, and you could mulch around it to, um, you know, keep weeds and that down. But uh, yeah, you could do that. Or you could just let it wait until the spring, build it now for your uh, uh, spring and summer vegetable gardens. I was trying to raise bed. That's what I was trying to think. Yeah, raise bed. Cause you have a raised bed already. You could just, you know, everything is basically gone out of my raised bed right now, except for a few things. But if you could just start from there, or would you, or would you dig up, you know, what's already at the bottom or just start layering? The well, if I had space because it decomposes, so I recharge those beds every now and then, I could just leave the existing stuff in the bottom. Mm -hmm. And um, I wouldn't bother doing uh, a weed control layer because there's already something I put um, garden cloth down as the first layer when I built those. Uh, so I could go in on right on top of the soil right now, put in, you know, like a brown layer and then alternate and some other stuff. Um, but the raised beds are mostly eight inch beds. And so I don't have a lot of room to put a lot of layers. But there's one I do have to rebuild where the wood uh, has basically all decomposed and it's full of weeds. So when I do that, I'm uh, redoing them because uh, I don't want to rebuild them again in another six or seven years when I'm 70. So I'm building them with a PVC board, which mm -hmm. will uh, outlast me. Uh, and those are a little bit deeper. They're about nine and a half, ten 10 inches. And if I build and repair that one with it, uh, yeah, I could consider doing uh, uh, this uh, in that new bed. Okay. Thank you very much. It was great experience. Yeah, Marty. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you again, everybody, for coming. You're welcome. And uh, we've got the emails on it. So if you have any other questions, you can always email us in the future.